NASCAR is in a very difficult situation right now. They basically have to answer a question that does not have a universally correct answer. <laughs> How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric, and welcome to Out of the Groove. We've got a couple things to talk about today, a couple of very interesting things, some things more concerning than others. Uh, man, I'm not sure where to start. Let's start with a, let's start off on a positive note. You know, usually when somebody asks, do you want good news or bad news first, usually people start with the bad news to get it out of the way. At least that's what I do. I feel like most people do it that way. But I think in today's case, let's start with some of the slightly positive news, I guess. Firstly, as far as TV ratings for Michigan are concerned, live viewers, uh, you know, the race had about a million and a half viewers, which is, you know, down compared to most races on Sunday afternoon but given that the Michigan race was run, run on a Monday evening uh, that's pretty good for a Monday that's actually very good for a Monday uh, compare that to Dover which they ran on a Monday afternoon at around noon a few weeks back that race had something like 750 780 thousand viewers Whew, very low for a cup race I know it's a Monday afternoon but compare that to this Monday late afternoon early evening race uh, and we had almost double that this shows that perhaps there actually is a place for prime time you know during the week NASCAR races I know some fans have asked for midweek races like a Wednesday night primetime NASCAR race uh, other fans maybe want like a Monday night NASCAR there's Monday night football how about Monday night NASCAR this shows that maybe there's something there. Obviously, 1.5 million viewers is still significantly lower than most other races would get that are run on Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening, uh, but it's not completely out of out of the ballpark. Given that we had a rain out on Sunday, I thought the ratings were going to be in the toilets for Monday, uh, but no, Monday night, Monday late afternoon, which they ran it in the late afternoon because of World Cup soccer during the day on Fox, so they wanted to give NASCAR its own slot in the evening. Uh, it wasn't too bad. Some more good, pretty positive news. Uh, if you're a Tyler Reddick fan, especially, uh, Richard Childress said earlier this weekend that he expects to have Tyler Reddick in a full-time Cup Series car next season. Not sure if it's going to be with RCR yet, but he wants it to be either with the team then or an affiliate team. Tyler Reddick won the NASCAR Xfinity Series Championship last season, but he did not dominate the season by any stretch of the imagination. He basically won the first race of the season at Daytona, and he didn't win again until the championship race at Homestead. So he won uh, the, the, at the timeliest of times. A lot of fans called it a fluke, but he then moved over to Richard Childress Racing before this year to drive one of their Xfinity cars. And he has dominated this year. He's leading the point standings. He's tied for the lead in the series with three wins. Uh, he's looking outstanding right now. He went from kind of an okay, he's an okay driver, not sure what his future is, to now, okay, he might be an actual star one day. Not going to jump that far ahead of myself, but right now the Xfinity Series has a lot of exciting young drivers. Christopher Bell, Cole Custer, Tyler Reddick now has emerged as one of the, if not the most exciting young drivers. He's already made a couple starts for Richard Childress Racing in the Cup Series this year, uh, but yeah, it sounds like if Richard Childress uh, can figure things out, he wants Tyler Reddick in a full-time Cup car next season. Like Now, like I said, not sure if it's going to be an RCR car. You know, right now, RCR only has two cars, Austin Dillon and Daniel Hemrick. They have room to expand, perhaps, uh, but he also was open to the idea of moving him over to an affiliate team. Like, Jermaine Racing with Ty Dillon is technically a uh, associated team, is an affiliate team with Richard Childress Racing, so there's a chance something could work out there, but if you're a Tyler Reddick fan, a uh, good chance he's going to be in the Cup Series next year. So that's I think that's, that's exciting. Next year could have a really intense rookie battle, especially if Christopher Bell gets a decent ride. Christopher Bell, Tyler Reddick, maybe Cole Custer makes it up into the into the Cup Series next year at some point. That would be a, a heck of a rookie battle. We've had kind of some lackluster ones the last couple of years. I think that one could be fun. Those are some guys that, you never know, might sneak into the playoffs as a rookie. And we haven't seen rookies do that much <laughs> in recent years. So it'd be a nice change of pace. But yeah, there you go. Good news if you're a Tyler Reddick fan. I think he could have a real future over there. And hopefully he can turn things around at RCR because things aren't looking so great right now. So those are some kind of positive, good, exciting stories. But now there are some... Well, there's one negative story and then another one that's just kind of perhaps concerning to some people. Uh, we'll start with the negative one. Uh, Alex Bowman, it was revealed today, will not have Nationwide on his car next season. Nationwide Insurance, who's been with Hendrick Motorsports for about the last five years, ever since Dale Jr. drove the 88, they announced today that they are planning to leave Hendrick Motorsports, leave the 88 car at the end of this 2019 season. They signed an extension last year that would have kept them on the 88 car through 2020, uh, but there was an option in that agreement that they could end it a year early, and they are exercising that agreement. Now, while Nationwide is leaving Hendrick Hendrick leaving the 88 car, they're not completely stepping away from NASCAR entirely. They're still going to be affiliated with Dale Earnhardt Jr., going to run some select advertisements with him, and they'll still be an associate sponsor at some NASCAR related events. So you won't, you'll still see Nationwide around, uh, perhaps, but you will not see them on a race car any anymore. A few key details to note here, uh, Alex Bowman is still under contract with Hendrick Motorsports through 2020, so no matter what happens with sponsorship from here on out, he will still be in that car next season. After that, 
I don't know, it's up in the air. And then the other thing as far as nationwide as a company is concerned, uh, this definitely doesn't reflect well on NASCAR when a big sponsor from one of your most popular teams is stepping away. However, it is worth noting that nationwide, they recently had a CEO change. They're changing their business behind the scenes quite a bit, so this might have just been inevitable. I kind of forgot they've really only been on the 88 car since like 2015, so they haven't really been in NASCAR nearly as long as I'd thought, or at least not with the 88 car as long as I'd thought. But yeah, those are some important things to point out. So Alex Bowman isn't going anywhere this offseason. He's still safe for at least one more year. Key takeaways from this breaking news, um, it's not too surprising personally. We all kind of knew that Nationwide Insurance was, you know, on that 88 car primarily for Dale Earnhardt Jr. I mean, he hasn't driven that car in two years, and yet at the beginning of this season when they revealed the paint scheme for Alex Bowman this year, Dale Jr. was right there at the unveilment. Like, the pictures were Alex Bowman, Dale Earnhardt Jr., and the car. Like, Dale Jr. hasn't driven this thing in two years, but Nationwide has still been milking the heck out of that endorsement deal uh, because Dale Earnhardt Jr., I know he's not driving anymore, but he's still the face of NASCAR in many ways. And Alex Bowman, while he's been pretty good the last year and a half driving that 88 car, he has nowhere near the notoriety Dale Earnhardt Jr. has. So it honestly came as a surprise to me last year when I heard that Nationwide was signing an extension with Alex Bowman and Hendrick Motorsports. I was like, wow, do they really believe in Alex Bowman? Because all this time, they felt like they were just a Dale Jr. sponsor. Looks now to me that that deal was very temporary. The fact that it was only a two-year extension and the sponsor had the option of opting out after just one year makes it sound like they were really just testing the waters with Alex Bowman and seeing if something would catch on. And I think they've seen enough. Alex Bowman, while he's been pretty good this year, he had that stretch of three straight second place finishes. He's getting some good screen time. I'll bet you Nationwide Insurance is not getting nearly the same value out of their deal with Bowman that they were getting with, with Dale Earnhardt Jr. So it makes sense to me that they would want to move things around. Bowman's not a bad driver, but he's just not the same popularity, the same person, the same celebrity that Dale Earnhardt Jr. is. Now, Hendrick Motorsports dodged a bullet when they were able to get Ally Financial on the 48 car this year and next year, for the next two years, actually. So that was a huge thing for them, uh, filling the hole that Lowe's had left behind. Do they have a second wild card up their sleeve here? Uh, Alex Bowman, you know, he's good through the rest of this year with sponsorship, but next year he's got a Salta is a big partner. I guess Vaveline. I don't know who else is really on that 88 car consistently. But Nationwide was supposed to be on the car for 20 out of the 36 races next year, so that's more than half their schedule they're going to have to find replacements for. It can be done, uh, but it's going to be tricky, and uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what they can do going forward. And if they can't find good sponsorship going forward, I think 2020 could be the last year we see Alex Bowman in that 88 car. It's just the name of the game these days. You need funding to uh, stay in top rides, and I'm sure if Alex Bowman doesn't get the funding... Uh, somebody else will. Somebody else will go to that car. So, I don't know. It's interesting. If I'm an Alex Bowman fan, I'm not feeling good today, but I'm also not feeling too bad. He is signed through next year. He's not leaving this offseason. This, this shouldn't be like a total backbreaker all of a sudden midseason. Things will be fine, I think. Bowman, if he continues at the trajectory he's been going at, steadily getting better and better. He was great last year, I thought. This year, he's seemingly starting to take a small step forward. If he can keep at that trajectory, I think he'll be fine. I think he will find sponsorship. He will find partnership. He still has Hendrick Motorsports behind him, the 88 car on his on the side of his car. Uh, I think he'll be just fine. But definitely concerning anytime a major sponsor leaves a driver. So uh, we'll see where this goes going forward. Now the last thing I want to talk about in this episode is arguably the biggest little tidbit of news to come out of this past weekend that really nobody is talking about. Bob Pachris, reporter for Fox Sports, formerly with ESPN, usually is uh, right on it with a lot of these things. He tweeted out that NASCAR is not looking to add horsepower back to their current 550 horsepower package going forward. Assuming in this tweet he's talking about, you know, next year's package 2020, which we still don't know exactly what it's going to be, or even the Gen 7 car, which, you know, NASCAR says they'll have it ready by 2021, who knows, but it sounds to me like NASCAR is planning going forward to stick with 550 horsepower. 550 horsepower is what they've been running at all the bigger tracks this year. The Texases, the Charlottes, the Michigans, the Daytonas. That's what they've been running this year, and it's created a different style of racing. If you've watched uh, the racing consi uh, consistently, you'll know that it's looked different this year at a lot of those tracks. Probably the biggest controversy this season has been about this aero package, this lower horsepower, high downforce package. Now, worth noting, he doesn't say anything about downforce. Could be a low downforce package with 550 horsepower. Who knows? Uh, but he is talking about the horsepower specifically, and that is one area that a lot of fans, I think, are literally split. I joke a lot of times about how NASCAR fans are kind of split 50-50 on a lot of things. Sometimes it's like 60-40, 70-30, something like that. But this is a case where I literally think a lot of NASCAR fans are are basically split 50-50. I think a lot of people personally feel split 50-50. They don't know exactly what side they land on. I think this is a 
perfectly dividing issue right here. Races this season with 550 horsepower have seen, you know, the draft come into play a lot more. Drivers are kind of having to use air. They're, you know, the cars are closer together usually. And in a lot of these races, there is more passing, more shuffling for position. Three and four wide racing at tracks that previously never saw three or four wide racing consistently. Uh, so the racing has been different this year, but it's been very aero dependent. It's turned a lot of these mile and a half, two mile races kind of into baby Daytona and Talladega races. Not quite the same effect we've seen at Talladega Daytona historically, where it's a huge pack and draft is all that matters. And, you know, it's kind of random. You could have, you know, Ty Dillon winning races. Not quite that random. We've seen this year, Kyle Busch, Joey Leon, Brad Keselowski, the best drivers and the best teams have still risen to the top and won pretty much all the races this year. But with this lower horsepower, yeah, the cars are more stable. They are easier to drive by themselves. In a pack, they still can get loose. They can still get sideways. Cars are closer together now, so there's obstacles everywhere now. So it's a different type of challenging for drivers. But but as far as the cars by themselves, they are more stable this year and they are probably, yeah, easier to drive than in years past. So that's where the controversy comes in. I think most people would agree. Races like Kansas, Charlotte earlier this year, the all-star race, uh, have been way better than previous or at least way more entertaining. I don't want to say better. That's a very subjective term, but at least I think more entertaining as far as more passes, more battles for the lead, more aggressive driving. Those races have been more entertaining in that respect than previous Kansas and Charlotte races. But at the same time, this package, and specifically the lower horsepower, has been criticized consistently by many drivers, mostly veteran drivers in NASCAR. Kyle Busch, Clint Boyer uh, have been two of the most vocal. Kevin Harvick's criticized it, some Truex as well. A lot of the younger drivers have been a little bit more positive about it, but most of the veteran drivers uh, have been very negative about it. They do not like driving these cars uh, at these big tracks with this lower horsepower. So that's where the controversy comes in. Fans know that, you know, these cars are more stable, which means I think, especially when they're driving by themselves, it does take less skill to control them. Part of the charm of watching NASCAR for many, many years was that these cars are racing at almost 200 miles an hour, usually on the edge of control, on the edge of out of control is a better way of putting it. Guys would spin out by themselves. People were really pushing it. Uh, the best drivers were able to push it for longer without losing focus. The worst drivers would lose focus occasionally and spin out. That's what made NASCAR NASCAR to a lot of fans. And this package has changed that at a lot of these bigger tracks. And that hasn't sat very well with many of the drivers. And that definitely hasn't sat well with a lot of the fans. So Eric, if the drivers don't like it and if about half the fans don't like it why is nascar planning on going with 550 horsepower in the future that doesn't make any sense the number one reason nascar is possibly going to go this route uh, is right there in the middle of bob pockers's tweet the fact that currently nascar runs outdated 900 horsepower engines that they restrict down to 550 but for the last you know however many years they've been running 900 horsepower engines that are just outdated and useless to allow the manufacturers toyota ford chevy these 900 horsepower engines they're building for NASCAR are purely for NASCAR. They don't take anything from these engines and transfer them into their street cars or into their business. NASCAR, the engines they build for NASCAR are purely for NASCAR and they're outdated and basically useless to the, to the manufacturers. By lowering the horsepower to 550, and we've talked about this at length on this show in many episodes, we've seen all the reports, we've seen what people at Toyota and other manufacturers have said, uh, but by lowering the horsepower to 550, other outside manufacturers, Dodge, Nissan, Honda, I don't know, uh, are interested potentially in joining the sport. And I don't care who you are, if you're a fan of NASCAR, more manufacturers coming into the sport is a good thing. It's more competition, it's more funding, it's more support. And NASCAR sees that as well, so they're obviously wanting to bring in these new manufacturers, and I think one big thing that's been echoed across all these new manufacturers, as well as possibly the existing ones, Ford, Chevy, and Toyota, they've said that they don't want to keep building 900 horsepower engines. They want to lower the horsepower. Just more cost effective. It makes a lot more sense for them business-wise. And so this is the problem. This is why I say NASCAR is trying to answer a question that doesn't have a correct answer. Because NASCAR has to please three different groups of people, uh, and there's really no one you universal way to do that. There's no one rules package, no one decision that I think would please all three of these sides. The fans want one thing. Actually, no, the fans want a few different things. The fans themselves are pretty divided on a lot of these things as well. So the fans are confusing. The second thing are the drivers. The drivers want these cars more out of control. They want less downforce. Most of them, at least. Most of them want less downforce, more horsepower. They want these cars to uh, be out of control and let the best drivers show off their best skills. That's what the drivers want. But the manufacturers and sponsors, they kind of go hand in hand, want the exact opposite. Especially the manufacturers, they want these cars uh, cheaper, more cost effective. And one of the number one ways to do that is to build smaller engines that aren't outdated and just behemoths. So that's the biggest problem. You got the manufacturers wanting one thing and the drivers wanting the exact opposite. And then over here, you got the fans who don't exactly know what they want. They can't come to a consensus on anything. And so NASCAR is trying to come up with one idea, one big idea that can please everyone. 
And they're kind of doing it by, you know, or making some changes here and there. It'll please, please these guys. Some that'll please these guys. You know, lowering five, going to 550 horsepower pleases the manufacturers. But like next year's schedule changes with like a Martinsville night race, switching up the, the end of season, the season finale race, the fact that they're looking at adding more short tracks, they've added the Charlotte Roval, a new road course, that's them trying to appease the fans. Fans have said they want more short tracks, more road courses, so NASCAR's trying to give it to them. It's all about trade-offs, and NASCAR is really trying to do little things here and there to make everyone happy. But the problem is if NASCAR went back to 900 horsepower, they'd make the drivers happy, they'd make some of the fans happy, but they would not make the manufacturers happy. By going to 550 horsepower, drivers won't be happy, some of the fans won't be happy, but the manufacturers will be very happy and could potentially double. They've said in the past, NASCAR thinks they could double the number of manufacturers if they go to 550. It's a huge gamble. It is a huge gamble because it is gonna completely change the way NASCAR stock cars are raced. It's gonna completely change the way outside competitors and up and coming competitors view stock car racing. If this is the package, 550 horsepower, if this is what they do going forward long term, it is gonna completely change the way drivers, fans, and anyone in the world views NASCAR racing as a sport. Many will view it as a big positive, um, others will view it probably as a negative. Uh, you can't deny that the show, the show aspect of NASCAR with the 550 horsepower, and a lot of these tracks this year has been pretty entertaining. That's why we've seen a lot of TV ratings go up this year. But the drivers aren't happy, and there's a vocal section of the fan base that aren't happy either, so this season, while TV ratings are up, actually attendance, I would say, is probably up as well. I know it's been up at few tracks specifically. Despite all that, this season still feels very divisive. It still feels like people are very split as to whether or not this season has been actually filled with good racing or bad racing. NASCAR fans are still very cynical. NASCAR fans are still questioning everything. A lot of NASCAR fans do not agree with each other. It's very hard to find two NASCAR fans that completely agree on anything. There's a lot of internal strife, and I do worry that if NASCAR goes with 550 horsepower long term, that strife is only going to continue and there's a chance that strife will get worse. It might not. It might eventually kind of teeter off and maybe people will come around and more fans will end up liking the package than not and maybe new fans will show up and they like the package. Maybe it'll work out fine for NASCAR. But 550 horsepower is its almost half of the horsepower we had seven or eight years ago, or whatever year it was, I think like 2013. My other big question is, you know, NASCAR's still running 750 horsepower at a lot of the short tracks and road courses this year. If this tweet from Bob Pockers is true, would they run 550 horsepower at those places as well? Because I don't know how that would work. Uh, I'm very concerned if this news comes out, turns out to be 100% true. Uh, I don't know how to feel about it entirely just yet because we don't know, obviously, if they're going to go with low. Maybe they might go with low horsepower or low, uh, low downforce and, and low horsepower. That might create something different. Not sure what that's going to create just yet. Uh, we don't know where they're going to go with this. But it sounds like NASCAR does want to make the engines smaller. That'll make the manufacturers happy. Might not make all the fans happy. Probably won't make very many drivers happy, but it will make the manufacturers happy. NASCAR is thinking, hey, engines will make the manufacturers happy with other things such as schedule and whatnot. I think they're going to try and make the other groups happy as well. I think everyone, when NASCAR kind of reinvents itself after 2020, like 2021, I would say, when NASCAR really reinvents itself that year with a new car, possibly a new Gen 7 car, a, big, a new big time schedule with a bunch of changes, I think there's going to be a lot of trade-offs in there. There's going to be, nobody's going to love it, love all the changes. Nobody's going to love every single change NASCAR makes in 2020. Everyone's going to be happy with some things and unhappy with other things. And I mean everybody, manufacturers, uh, sponsors, drivers, fans, they're all going to love some of it, hate other parts of it. And that's just the way it's going to be, unfortunately. I don't think there's any solution out there that makes 100% of everybody happy. If there was, I trust NASCAR would have figured it out by now. They've experimented with just about everything the last 15, 20 years. You'd think they would have found some sort of good combination if one existed, but I don't think one exists. I think no matter what decision they make, it's always going to upset about half of their audience or half of the people involved. I'm not saying this is the best decision if they go with 550 horsepower going forward. I don't know that it's the best this decision. Uh, I'm pretty torn on it myself at the moment if this does turn out to be uh, the long-term future for uh, Cup Series racing. Um, but I think time will tell. I would like to wait until more information comes out. I'd like to hear it, you know, wait until I hear it from the horse's mouth. We definitely have knew that this was a possibility. I mean, Steve O'Donnell, Steve Phelps, high ups at NASCAR have said recently that they've liked most of what they've seen with the package this year. Uh, you know, they've liked aspects that they've saw in the all-star race and stuff. You remember they tested a different splitter and they tested the uh, engine aero ducts, the nostrils, if you will. This isn't a shocking report or anything, but I don't know, it alarms me because it lacks detail. And obviously this isn't true. This is just Bob Pockris. You know, obviously he's very well informed. This could still just be a rumor. This is not a confirmed report or anything, but uh, coming from Bob Pockris and given recent discussions, something to talk about.
Anyway, though, y'all, I appreciate you sticking through this episode. I talked a lot there. I hope I made some sense. Uh, let me know if you guys agree or disagree uh, with this tweet, with this possibility. Let me know Let me know what you think NASCAR is thinking long term. Uh, I'd be curious to hear uh, you guys' opinions down in the comments. But as always, remember, thank you for watching. And remember, you can uh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram. You can also check out how you can get an Out of the Groove t-shirt and support me, support the show. Those are down by the description. And, of course, a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. Michael Harrison at you as the stars. Uh, mentally Defective Cameron James, John Koblenz, Jason R. Long, Wesley Donaldson, Isaac Dennison, Mika Suzuki, iFancyRace.com, TheRacingInsiders.com, Matthew Kulopoulos, Adam Lean, Peppy Luscious, and the rest of these awesome Patreon supporters. I appreciate you guys' support so, so much. Helps me continue to do this show and continue to make more and more episodes each week. I couldn't do this without all of you, so thank you for the support. And yeah, that's all I got. I know a long episode, a lot of stuff I was talking about there. I hope I didn't just talk in circles the whole time. Uh, but thank you guys, as always, for watching. Should have another episode up later this week. I got some episodes planned for next week as well. And then, of course, that's the off weekend, so try to hopefully find some time for some extra fun NASCAR related videos uh, in between now and then. So thanks everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I'll see y'all again very, very soon. Good things are coming. Thanks for watching y'all.